All right. Hello there, everybody. Everybody find a seat. We're going to talk about bugs. All right. So I am John Lundgren. Uh, I work for Ignisus Foundation and uh, the Blue Dasher Farm Initiative. So this is a nonprofit 501c3. Um, and what we are trying to do is bring science to regenerative farming. Um, in a lot of ways, you guys in this room are leading the science. You guys know more about these regenerative systems than the scientists do. And so what we're trying to do is bring and, and, and uh, do something a little bit different and bring the science to the farmers who are really trying to innovate things. Um, Blue Dasher Farm. This is uh, who we are. <laughs> Let's see, it doesn't look like we've got the video working on that, but you can see part of it there. The research facility is kind of taken off. Um, what we want this to be, we're located up in, and I don't have a pointer either, do I? All right. Uh, we are located up there in South Dakota, right on the Minnesota border. Um, this is the first of what we are hoping becomes a national network of Centers for Excellence in Regenerative Agriculture. What is regenerative agriculture? It is conserving soil and biodiversity while producing healthier food profitably. Okay? Real strong focus on using the tools that nature is giving us rather than fighting against it. All right. Um, we are crowdfunded, 100%, no strings attached. Because science, folks, is manipulated. It's a dirty world. Science is manipulated in a lot of cases. And so in order to distance us from that, we went out to the farmers and the beekeepers and our support network from around the world and we said, if you believe that science is necessary to keep this moving forward, then please consider supporting us. And through small donations, we crowdfunded a research facility. That's never happened before. But I think it gives a lot of credence to the fact that there's something really special going on right now. Um, that allows us, our startup costs uh, are being uh, addressed like this, allows us to uh, uh, answer the tough questions without worrying about where that next paycheck is going to come from, okay? So we can be straight shooters with you. We can tell the truth, all right? What is our goals? First off, as I said before, we're going to be cutting, or, uh, conducting cutting-edge research. The science has to be there. We have to have data because the, the, right now there is a preponderance of evidence that is being used to support the current paradigm and why this is working. Um, and the only way to fight such data is, or fight fire is with fire, right? Aha, uh -huh, here we go. Thank you, Keith. All right, next, education. We have graduate students that are passing through our program. We have partnerships with uh, one university right now that is growing to two or three universities. Um, we are training uh, the next generation of scientists to think with systems as opposed to component research, like I'm an entomologist, I'm going to work on bugs, and ignore everything else that's in that system, that isn't getting us where we've got to go, folks. Okay? We're also developing an education curriculum to train the next generation of beginning farmers, not just training them in systems level thinking, but also providing the support network so that as we reintegrate these young farmers back into their communities, that they have somebody to rely on and somebody to help make sure that these guys and gals are successful. Because everybody in those communities are going to be watching, right? How are they doing? What are they doing? This stuff is crazy. And if they fail, nobody else is going to try it. We have to make sure this next generation is successful. And then finally, we have an operating demonstration farm. Because as a scientist, I can tell you 
<laughs> that, and I'll maybe talk about this a little bit more in a while, but uh, getting up here, me getting up here and as a scientist and giving advice, oh gosh, you know, you should do this, that, and the other thing on your farm, and this is, you know, all of the data points to this, and as you can see from this p-value and these error bars on this graph, that this is exactly what you should be doing. That is distance from the real world. And so we are putting our practices, all of what we're saying, into an operating farm. And I can tell you that I have never learned so much so quickly as when we have started to keep our own bees and trying to raise our own. Uh, our, uh, we're supporting what we're doing using this, this Blue Dasher farm. So it gives us that connection, OK? All right, let's see. <clears throat> Entomology, that's what you all came here for, right? Entomology. When I tell people that I am an entomologist, they tell me that the only good bug is a dead bug. That is not true. That is not what we do. But it's understandable, right? Because entomologists estimate that around the world there's around 3,500 species of insects that are pests. They eat our food. They eat our crops right out of the field. They eat our grain out of the bin. These little bastards, they, they, they bite our children in the night. They they, uh, insects have killed more soldiers than bullets or bombs have through disease transmission. Insects have actually turned the tides of war. 3,500 species. We have got to kill these things, right? We've got to wipe insects off of the face of the earth. We can do it. God, there's all kinds of jugs. You can buy any jug that you might want to, and it's got something that'll kill a bug. So let's spray it, right? Spray the world. No, because when we have a pest-centric mentality, not just towards insects, but toward biodiversity in general, we forget that those pests are the minority, not just a little mi <laughs> they are They are infinitesimally small. That, that's hard to get off of the tongue. For every pest species that's out there, there's 1,700 species of insects that are helping us. That we would not be here if it was not for these insects. Entomologists value insects just in the United States at around $63 billion annually. That's what they contribute to human society. How? Because insects, biodiversity is great in its own right, right? But it's great also because it does things. Biodiversity provides services. Services. What does insects do? Well, in a nutshell, they are the basis of complex food webs. Okay. Anybody, uh, anybody hunt, fish, watch birds? Yes? Four people. Four people do. <laughs> All right. If you like these things, think an insect. Without insects, we would not be able to support the wildlife that we enjoy for recreation. Anybody like fruits and vegetables? What proportion ate the bananas instead of the donuts over there? Ah, fess up. All right, that's good. Nice. One in every three bites. I, I heard Clint was out here with you guys yesterday out at Jonathan's place. I really regret missing that. Um, uh, uh, for one in every three bites uh, uh, that we eat is, is pollinated by an insect. And, and the pollinator crisis is very real, all right? This is a very real thing. This is not some imagination. This is not a cycle. Everybody like, oh, it's a cycle. We've lost bees before. No, folks. <laughs> Imagine losing 50% of your crop or your livestock every year for a decade. That is what we are asking the beekeepers to, uh, to overcome. And every year. This is just the new normal. And where go the bees, so go we, everybody. No bees, no plants, no plants, no people. It's just that simple. All right? And you guys, everybody in this room has a responsibility 
for the land that you manage and you can make decisions that will help turn this tide. I hate to say it, but insects are a major component of human diets. In fact, European cultures are the only ones on the planet Earth that do not rely on insects as a source of protein in their diet. Okay? Uh, anybody like crab legs or lobster? I hate to say it, but it's a big bug. It's a big bug, everybody. Um, insects. Wow, what's going on out there? Are they mowing in December? Uh, is that the drones coming to wipe me out? That could be. All right. Uh, return nutrients to the soil. Here's the, yeah, you guys may have heard this yesterday, but here it is again. What's the cycle of things? You got nutrients in the soil. Plants take those nutrients up, large ruminants and other herbivores come and eat those things. Then they poop it out. There the crap sits. All that nutrient sits until we can make it bioavailable for the next generation of microbes. Thank you, insects, for that, right? In fact, I estimate that in a healthy crop ground that we have more than 1 billion insects and 500,000 worms per acre. I've measured this, okay? I've counted the little guys. It takes a long time. At that, at that scale, that's more, almost half a percent of the total soil biomass is just living insects, okay? That's a significant source of carbon in its own right, all right? And we can manipulate that, right? We can manipulate those biological communities. So that's, that's important, right? Soil health, soil biology is not just microbes. I love them, but come on, you can't even see the little guys. Insects are a really important component of that soil biology. They influence when and where the microbes live, and vice versa. Insects are nature's insecticides, predators, parasitoids, restrict when and where your pests are going to occur. Anybody uh, hear of a thing called sugarcane aphid? Yeah, maybe one or two. Guess what? It is a result of your farming practices that you have sugarcane aphid on your property. And we'll talk more about that later, okay? All right, insects are nature's herbicides. Through feeding on the seeds, and the brown and the green parts of the plants, they restrict and shape where weed communities occur on your farm. Okay? We can use these as tools, right? We can use these. We often give advice as entomologists, go out there and kill this insect now because you will lose your farm if you don't. The reason, or we presume that this is based on scientific information, that this is based on data. The reality is that this is not often true. In eastern South Dakota, we have a lot of corn. And we've been giving advice to corn producers. Kill this bug now, buy this product, buy this jug, buy this bag of seeds, and go out there and plant it because you need to kill these bugs. But when I looked into the scientific literature, we quickly realized that there had never been a concerted survey, scientific survey, of when and where insects were actually occurring within cornfields in eastern South Dakota. This is a problem. These are not data-driven decisions at that point, right? So we tried to remedy that. We looked at corn farms, 53 of them, that spanned a range of different conditions. But they had to be non-BT, and they had to be, hopefully, untreated with insecticides. This last qualification turned out to be impossible because neonicotinoid seed treatments are on about 95% of all corn acres right now. And they are being used unnecessarily. And you are paying for it, 10 to $15 an acre. Okay? And a lot of guys don't even know that they're doing it. And so what we found is that we would ask these farmers, have you used any insecticides on your corn? They would tell us no. Then we would go out there and we would look at their bag and then we would explain, well, you did use insecticides. Oh, well, I just used the seed treatment. I'm like, no, 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 you don't understand. That is the insecticide, okay? That is the insecticide. 
So uh, we're hoping that most of that was out by the time we surveyed these. Fields, what did we find? What did we find? We found 107 insect species. And by insects, I mean anything with more than four legs and less than two legs. And that's just in the corn canopy. Okay? Corn is not devoid of diversity. All right? There's quite a bit of species that live in these eastern South Dakota cornfields. 107 species. Of these, though, only 7% of those species were primary pests. What is a primary pest? This is like the corn rootworm or the European corn borer, uh, western bean cutworm, aphids, things like that. But on all 53 farms, none of these were at economically threatening levels. Guys are spending two to $300 extra per bag to manage pests that aren't even there. That's stupid. That's a bad business decision, right? Who's telling you to do that? Guys who are selling you the bags of seed is who's telling you to do that. Question it. Question it. Of these 107 species, 13% have some impact on corn, but they're, very, they're viewed as neutrals, right? They're out there, they're nibbling here and there, they don't pay to manage. So what is the other 80% of species? We found nearly 150,000 predators per acre just in the corn canopy. What are these predators? Ants, pirate bugs, lady beetles, uh, damsel bugs, lace wings, spiders. That's a ton of predation. Go, uh, power going on, right? It's a lot of predator power. So the question that I get is if we've got all these wonderful predators, then why do we still have these pests? And this is a question that I've had to try to answer myself over the years because in, in spouting off the power of diversity, if we've got that much, then why do we still have these pests out there? And I think that the conclusion is that we still don't have enough species. We have to be comparing, we have to look to natural systems to try to understand what's going on in our own cropland. And when we do that, we see that the corn and other crops that have replaced these other systems and, and looking at the relative diversity in these things. This was done by one of my master's students. He's almost finished up with his PhD down at uh, Kansas State now. Um, and he looked at, Ryan looked at uh, uh, entire plant and insect communities in prairies, pastures, and cornfields. Nobody's really ever done this before in eastern South Dakota. He counted everything. It was a pain in the neck, all right? It's a lot of work to do these bio inventories. What did he find? About 3,000 specimens of insects, representing about 344 species of insects that were collected. A lot of these were little parasitoid wasps. I'll talk about them in a minute. A lot of the other ones were these little black flies. We found a pair of identical twins. And we also found about 75 plant species in these different systems. So how were they distributed? Here is the total number of species. This is the prairie, this is the pasture, and this is corn. It has about a third, maybe a quarter of the species that used to be in these ancestral habitats. Why is that important? Why is that important? Because decisions that are made on your farms influence when and w that diversity, and that diversity influences when and where you have pest outbreaks. Here, each of these dots is a cornfield from that 53 cornfield study that we just did. This is species diversity. High is good, low is bad. This is uh, pest density. This is log scale, sorry about that. Um, and what this is, is what this is trying to tell you is that cornfields that have high diversity have very few pests. Cornfields that have no diversity or very low diversity is where the pests are occurring. All right? Community evenness. This means within that 
uh, 107 species, are they all at equal abundances or are they all over the place? An even community has everything in balance, right? Here we find that cornfields that have an even community have few pests. Cornfields that have outbreak species here, there, and everywhere are where your pests are coming into play. Your decisions that foster diversity, what are those things? Planting cover crops, intercropping, rotations, field margins, those all foster diversity, will reduce your pest problems. They are systems that are resilient to pests. What lowers diversity? Insecticide use, right? Herbicide use, fungicide use, monocultures, right? How does this work? Whenever we have tried, this is not my opinion, this is demonstrated throughout history, whenever we have tried to replace Mother Nature with technology, Mother Nature turns around and kicks us in the crotch. Right? Maybe not right away, but eventually she plants one rain on us, right? How does diversity work? It works in a lot of ways in ways that we can't even hope to understand. That's humbling for a scientist to try to say, or have to say, is that we can't even begin to understand the complexity of the natural world to understand all of the mechanisms that are at play here. But we do know some things. And one of those ways that biodiversity works is with predation. So here we have Aureus insidiosus. Actually, there are these little guys. They're about yay big. You may have Aureus tristicolor down here. They're kind of kissing cousins. And this is the soybean aphid. These uh, pirate bugs, they have, they have these mouth parts that they inject saliva into their prey, and then they digest them while they're still alive. They suck up the juices. It's really cool. And here the aphid is uh, it, it's like squirting out of its cornicles, this anti-predator defense and it's sticky and it binds to the mouth parts. Woo wee, lots of cool stuff going on in the natural world. All right, so let's talk about this. Let's talk about predation and biodiversity. My slide is loading, there it is. All right. This question right here is, an, it's, it's, it's actually been going around in the scientific literature for years and years. And if you get enough ecologists in the room, they'll fight it out to the death, possibly to the death, all right, over this question. Because as you increase diversity within a system, what are all those predators supposed to eat? Is this a good thing for pest management or a bad thing? If you put more predators into a system, then what are they going to eat? They're going to eat each other. And so who knows whether or not this is going on. And so we've tried to study this in very curtailed environments. We tried to bring this out to the field to understand this much better. All right, let me see if I can do this. We decided to choose, and I'm sorry to talk so much about corn, but you got to look at where I live, OK? Corn rootworms. You guys grow plenty of corn down here, but you have a little bit different pest complex. Corn rootworms, though, you do have, if I'm not mistaken. The Mexican corn rootworm is a big deal. This is a beetle. It is a beetle pest. The uh, beetles uh, find a corn crop in the fall, and they lay their eggs at the base of the corn plants. And then in the spring, if you plant corn in that same spot, the larvae hatch and they burrow inside of the roots, which makes the plants fall over, very difficult to harvest, and uh, it also reduces yields, okay? So it's been recognized for a pest for over 100 years, like a long, long time, and millions, if not hundreds of millions of dollars of research money has gone into this to find out that no matter what we throw against the corn rootworm, turns around, it spits it back out at us, and then it flips us the bird, right? This has been an incredibly resilient pest. Thinking that we had it licked, we, uh, crop rotation, right? Corn soybean rotation comes about, and that, that really did a number on the rootworms for a long time. It is now resistant, not once, but twice. Two different forms of resistance. The first 
is it, instead of laying its eggs at the base of corn plants, it now lays its eggs on the base of soybean plant. And so that the next year, it hatches into the corn phase of the rotation rather than vice versa. So it's figured out what plants to lay its eggs in because it's figured out its ro our rotations. Number two is some of those, uh, they involved a resistance by extending its diapause. So instead of overwintering one year, it now overwinters two or three years. So it bypasses the soybean phase of the rotation. That's a smart pest. But don't worry, everybody. Don't worry. The answer's all in the bag, right? It's all in the bag. We've got BT corn seed and neonicotinoid seed treatments. It took about three years for the corn rootworm to evolve resistance to BT corn. And that resistance is now spreading. Uh, Neonix has not been documented, but I don't know anybody that's studying it. I think people are too afraid, quite frankly. So when I began working on this, entomologists that had spent their entire careers studying the corn rootworm told me that there was no predators. Nothing eats this thing. I'm like, oh, OK, that, that flies in the face of basic ecological knowledge. But uh, we decided to try to, we tried to uh, develop some new tools in order to study this question. Okay. Um, number one, is it's very difficult, right? Because the larvae of these things live in corn roots under the ground. You can't just watch predation going on. But we did, what we did is we stuck a pin through the butts of the rootworms, and then we put them out in the field so they can wriggle around and stuff, and then we'd come and watch who came to eat them. And what we were able to find is that as predation goes up on those little sentinels, we find it within a plot, within a cornfield, that that is a general uh, 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 estimate of predation pressure within that corn plot, and that that is negatively correlated with root damage by the rootworms in these fields. So more predation, less root damage by the corn rootworm. We also developed some new tools looking um, at, at uh, DNA. Um, so we, we'd catch predators in the field, and then we'd chop off their heads and their butts, and then we'd rip out their stomachs. And then we'd look inside for rootworm DNA sequences. And we can actually tell which species of predators are eating corn rootworms in the field. And we've I'd been able to identify dozens of species that are doing this. So predation is a very real thing for the rootworm, OK? OK, that's good. So we could get back to that question that I was talking about earlier. What happens with diversity and, preda uh, and predation of a key pest? We did this. We decided to study this in situ, in cornfields, all right? We did this over two years, 16 fields. And then we infested those corn fields with our handy dandy corn rootworm egg infester. This sucker is calibrated to deliver 1,000 corn rootworm eggs per row foot. All right? So we infested our corn fields. And then we took soil cores and we collected out the corn rootworm larvae as well as entire insect communities that were out there. We then tore out the digestive systems of the predators, and we analyzed more than 2,000 individual predators using this uh, genetic technique. This is a beetle digestive tract. Isn't that cool, you guys? They've got a gizzard, just like a chicken does, huh? Right there. All right. So what did we find? Oh, shoot. Yeah, this didn't work. That's too bad. Is there a slide? Is there a picture underneath this one, or is this a PC Mac problem? All right. So what we found is uh, essentially, yeah, I'll just skip to the punchline then. This is what you want, right? This is the information that you're interested in. We got literally dozens of species that were testing positive for the, for the corn rootworm, but at different levels. And this is the proportion of positive per plot. So this is, these are the proportion of the uh, predators in a cornfield that has rootworm DNA in it. So we've got about 6%, about 6% of predators. That sounds like a pretty low number. Until you understand what this technique is actually measuring, 
So everybody, all that donut and that bananas and, and tangerines over there that you guys were just eating on, as soon as you ingest food, you instantly start to digest its DNA, such that we can only detect within predatory insects its last meal for around eight hours or so. Okay? So what this is saying is 6% of the, those 2,000 predators had eaten corn rootworms in the last eight hours. All right? That's better. 6% of 2,000 is not very many, but when we do actual density samples, it's in the hundreds of millions of predators per acre that we're finding in even heavily managed cornfields. 6% of hundreds of millions of predators that ate rootworms in the last eight hours, that's a hell of a lot of predation pressure that's going on in these fields. And I promise I'll only point out error bars one time, we have variability in the, in the 16 fields. That means that we have predators that are acting at different efficiencies in these different corn fields. That means we can test whether or not more diversity leads to greater or less predation. All right, here we go. Follow along. These are corn fields. As predators increase in number, they rely on corn rootworms more heavily. Right? That's interesting. As we increase the number of species in these cornfields, they rely on corn rootworms more heavily as prey. Why? Why, as that predator community gets saturated, would they eat more of the pest? Why does that happen? I have an idea. We've all gotten one of these, and I hope you guys all have. It's a good feeling, right? The orange cream is always the last damn chocolate in that box. <laughs> Sometimes somebody's taken a bite out of it and put it back in there. You've seen it. I believe that the corn rootworms are the orange creams, oh my goodness, are the orange creams of the insect prey world. And I have evidence to prove it. Okay, cue video one, the one with the caterpillar, not the little white grub. There it is. So these are my predators. This is a Harpalus pensylvanicus. This is just a caterpillar, a very palatable prey item. Look at what happens. This is what we do for fun as entomologists. It's <laughs> the blood and gore as this thing is just wrestled. Look at this going on, right? That is a tough predator right there. Squirming, there's blood everywhere. So we, uh, I have a, my, one of my professors with, with my PhD, uh, she was talking to some kids um, about beetles. And so she asked all of the entomology students, you know, hey, if you've got any beetles, you know, uh, give me some. And so I said, okay, here's some carabid beetles and here's some caterpillars. When you're ready for the show to start, put the caterpillars with the beetles. And so she get, comes back like a week later, and I went to pick up my beetles, and I'm like, how'd it go? She's like, well, you actually scared the children, John. <laughs> you, scared, you scared the children. All right, so this is what often happens, right, in a, in a normal field setting. Now cue video two. This is the corn rootworm larva. The predator, my big burly predator, she comes along, takes a bite, and starts breaking. Look at that. A hundred years we've been studying this pest. It flips over. This is what my kids do when we serve lasagna. Flopping around on the floor. In a hundred years, nobody had ever described that the blood of the rootworm had anti-predator properties. It's sticky. It instantly sticks to the predator's mouth parts, and it has a chemical repellent to it that actually uh, is repulsive to many predators. We spent thousands of dollars, you know, developing these, uh, these microbial, or these molecular assays to study a predation events that may or may not be going on with great frequency in the field. So we did some more work on that, and we can get back to the presentation then. We find that this is not universally the case, that some predators, it depends on the type of mouth parts that they have. 
beetles that have these chewing mandibles, they are particularly um, uh, uh, susceptible to the defense. But other predators, like spiders that suck, and ants that kind of eat or more fluid feeding, they do not seem to be as affected. As an example, we had, uh, uh, I did the same assay with a wolf spider, which is freaky because they jump out of the petri dishes on you. I mean, well-trained entomologists, we're all sitting around in this, and, and we've all worked with spiders before, but there is just innate fear, okay? And so these itty bitty wolf spiders are like jumping into our laps and people are coming in, why are you screaming so much? There's nothing we could do about it. Anyways, so, so this, this spider takes a bite, right? Just like what you saw of the rootworm, it takes a bite, and it's like instantly like, oh, you taste like ass, you know? But instead of running away, it keeps its foot right on the rootworm. And after a couple of minutes, it turns over and it takes another bite, and it's like, oh, you still taste like ass. <laughs> but eventually, by the third or fourth try, oh my goodness, I'm kicking things all over the place. All right, uh, we, I'll find a place, there we go. Eventually, it overcomes that praise defense system, and it's pretty cool to watch. Uh, anyway, so the sucking predators, okay, so this graph is prey consumption index. This is taken in the field. Sucking predators eat more rootworms, both the eggs and the larvae. Okay, that's what you were, that was the take home message. So that means that sucking predators do not look at rootworms like the orange cream. Chewing predators do. So we would expect to see this relationship between diversity and predation in the chewing predators, but not the sucking predators. And I wouldn't bring it up if I didn't have the data to show it. Here we see a nice flat line where the chew er, sucking predators have no reaction. Regardless of how many species are in that corn community, they always eat rootworms at the same level. But with the chewing predators, it's like we have to saturate that predator community to force them to eat the, the least palatable prey items, which happens to be our pest. What is this? Mob grazing. That's what it is, right? This is mob grazing in insects. We've got to be saturating these communities in order to force the ecosystem services to work. Cool, huh? It's about balance, right? It's about balance in these communities. How do we get it? Folks, this is simple. Reduce disturbance and increase diversity. Just that simple. Regenerative systems, I've talked to a hell of a lot of farmers. And there are four general principles that the successful guys have. Number one, stop tilling or dramatically reduce your tillage. Understand the tillage is a very damaging thing. Number two, always have a living root in the soil. Number three, more diversity is better than less diversity when it comes to plants. Number four, we've got to integrate animals back into our cropping system. That's it. The practices are going to vary depending on where you live and how you apply these things. There's lots of ways to skin a cat, which is a horrible metaphor, but it always works, right? <laughs> Why does reducing disturbance happen? This is it. In a nutshell, folks, this is our problem. We come in, we kill all of the biology in the soil, or a lot of it. And then we plant thousands of acres of, their fa of, a, of a single plant species that has been genetically selected for large seeds at the expense of just about every other defensive trait that that plant has ever had. The first species to come in here are the primary pests. We have eliminated all of the biotic resistance to that pest proliferation, and we replace it with an agrochemical. The more you use, the more you got to use. It's an addiction. It's an addiction by its very definition. How do you increase diversity? There's lots of ways. There's lots of ways. One of my good friends, uh, Dwayne Beck, uh, says that uh, one of his favorite sayings is, in South Dakota, we've got a great rotation uh, that a lot of guys use. It's corn, snow, corn. <laughs> that is not diverse enough. Cotton. Cotton, fallow cotton, 
Doesn't work. Doesn't work. Science has consistently shown that a rotation of approximately seven years with at least two years in a perennial rotation or perennial crop is the best for maximizing the profitability of a cropping system over time. Okay? Intercropping. Corn soybean rows have 30 inches in between them of bare soil. Let's use it. Right? Smaller crops, more or <laughs> smaller plots, more crops. Cover crops make a hell of a lot of ecological sense. They connect growing seasons. They provide biological uh, fortitude to support biotic resistance to pest proliferation. Be it weeds, be it fungi, be it, uh, be it, be it insects, you name it, right? And you can make money off of them by grazing them. Field margins, conservation strips, these are not something to be mowed or hayed. These are a tool, and I hope that Clint hit on this yesterday with his pollinator stuff. These are a tool that you can then have spillover effects in your cropland to reduce your input costs. These are worth money to you, okay? I hate to say it, but a zero tolerance policy toward weeds needs to go away, all right? I understand there's constraints of weeds. We've gotten bit in the ass by weeds ourselves. But we need to understand that weeds are telling us something. That if you've got a weed problem, it's telling you something. These are early successional plants. You're giving them a space. And they're going to take it. All right. Cover crops. Let's put this into practice. All of this talk about diversity. How does this, it's all well and good until we show that it actually works. We use cover crop, uh, just a single species, because I was just getting into this, a slender wheatgrass. This is a native wheatgrass species up that's uh, well adapted to our conditions. And then we compared it with corn grown in bare soil. We terminated the slender wheatgrass in spring with an herbicide. So really what we're talking about is the, is the residue left over from the wheatgrass. We then uh, infested these different fields with, um, with corn rootworms, and we counted the pest populations as well as looked at root damage. We got down on our hands and our knees, and we sucked up with using these aspirators, anything that was living on the soil surface. Here we've got our uh, sentinel larvae. So what this is is a caterpillar, or in this case a corn rootworm, that has had a pin stuck through its terminal segment. And then we put it out in the field, and we come back and we watch who's eating it after an hour. We did this during the day and in the middle of the night. In, uh, in side projects, we have, uh, we've actually seen how long maggots can survive with a pin stuck through their butts. And they can complete their comp entire development, like through adulthood all with a, with a pin stuck through their butts. Actually, it reminds me of some supervisors that I've had over the years. <laughs> all right. This is what happened with predators. 2007, we've got the cover crops and the bare soil. We had a lot more, a lot more predators in the cover crop. 300 predators per meter squared. It's a lot of predation potential. These are the pests. This is the youngest larvae. This is the middle-aged larvae. These are the oldest larvae. We found no difference between cover crops and bare soil. No difference. And then in the third instar, we saw a 67% reduction in corn rootworm larvae. And this translated all the way up to the adult stage. By the cover crop, what happened? How did this work? Well, we think, and I've got some data that I haven't published yet, but I think what's going on is that when you have a cover crop on the ground, it changes the crop's physiology, the cash crop. And in this case, it's changing the root physiology of the, of the corn plant, such that those older larvae that require a bigger root are able to, or are, are, are needing a better host. And as they leave the plant, because the cover crop has changed their host plant, they leave the crop, and when they do, there's about three to four times as many predators that are there waiting to eat them. So it's the old one-two punch. That's how biodiversity works. 
not in a way that we can predict when we're going in. Something we have to sit back and observe and appreciate. This is what happened to the damage on the crop. We found that it was reduced in both years significantly just by having cover crops the preceding year's corn. Okay, We've done the numbers on it now. We, uh, one of my master's students, Claire Lacan, she's just writing up her thesis now, but we did, and this, we did some of this work on greens uh, at, down in Bladen. Um, we looked at a dozen fence line comparisons of proactive pest management versus reactive pest management in corn production. Proactive being oftentimes no-till um, and uh, cover crops, um, and they did not use any insecticides. The reactive was all in the bag, you know, just conventional production, BT corn, neonics, uh, just a very standard corn production. And these were best practices, right? This was not me putting this onto a research farm and saying, this is the way the farmer should do it. This was the farmers themselves defined the practices and we just observed those practices. We found that the cover crop fields, the corn fields, <laughs> and I don't know how I'm going to publish this because it flies in the face of everything that we know. The insecticide treated corn fields had tenfold more pests. They had, the two treatments had equivalent yields. So when you hear this argument, well, we've got to feed the world, the bull. Bull crap, right? That we cannot feed the world with soil health. That is that is that drives me up the wall. Number three, the cover crop fields had twice the profitability. Okay? This makes sense, guys. This is not just ideological, like, oh, you've got to do this to save the planet or something like this, which would be a good thing. But this is also a good business decision, okay? We've got diverse communities. Bugs are cool. Bugs do things. We can use these as a tool, right? But we've got to change our, how we think about them. There's two ways of getting biological control or predation to start working for you. Habitat diversity. You've got to bump it up or I'm sorry, habitat disturbance, you've got to get that up, and or, I'm sorry, <laughs> down, down, and then di diversity up. Reduce disturbance, increase diversity. All right, folks, we need a humbler approach to pest management. We need to stop thinking that we're always in control, sometimes, or that we know the best answer. Sometimes the best answer is just get out of the way. Right? Because the systems worked pretty well before we started monkeying with them. We should look at these natural systems as a guide and then start adjusting our agroecosystems accordingly. And there's ways that we can do it. Things like covers and all of this plant diversity that you guys are talking about at this meeting are an integral part of that. Um, yeah, we wouldn't be here if it was not for farmers and ranchers and beekeepers like you guys. So if you believe in this kind of research, consider supporting it. Um, we, yeah, we're a 501c3. You can either give the money to the government or you can actually uh, uh, ta tax time or else you can donate it to reduce your tax burden. Uh, lot, hundreds of people from around the world uh, donate in order to get us up and off the ground. And we just have a tremendous team of young enthusiastic scientists that are just yeah rocking it they make it so much fun to come into work every day and there is our contact info we're on Facebook we're on Twitter <coughs> follow us please and like us I, I, I really dislike social media but we found that it's a necessary evil um, and so but here's our websites as well and you can go there if you would like to learn a little bit more about us and what we're trying to do